the uh, idea here is that we're, we have two wonderful scientists who have been doing remarkable work uh, in Arizona on agaves uh, for many, many long years in, in Wendy's case. And uh, the, they're going to share... Sorry. <laughs> many, many, many. <laughs> the, I can offend people so quickly. It's okay. <laughs> um, anyhow, back on track. The idea is to enjoy the good food and uh, drink, and it's going to be a conversation. And they're very close to their little plants here. How uh, you see how they arrange them in the in the middle of the the table here between the two of them. So I go back to the. 1970s when these strange rock pile features out in the landscape were believed to be agricultural but there were no really good explanations of what the heck was being grown out in those places. Uh, Paul and Susie Fish and the uh, project uh, for the Central Arizona project that uh, came brought the canals down to Tucson did some really innovative research to identify the fact that agave was one of those important plants out on that landscape at least. And the kind of work that then coming at it with a botanical perspective that Wendy and uh, Andrew Salawan have been, been doing is really ex super exciting as our understanding of the archeological distribution of this material has changed. Their ability to bring new information from the botanical side of it is, is really exciting. So. Uh, I want to turn this over to uh, Wendy and Andrew, and we'll talk about agave and how it's grown and other things that botanists and folks who can deal with DNA can tell us about uh, <laughs> this kind of material. So onward. Great. Oh, thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure for, for both of us to be here tonight and uh, share with you some uh, of our work regarding agaves. and. We're really trying to carry on the tradition of uh, the late, great Dr. Howard Scott Gentry, uh, who worked at, who was our research director at the Desert Botanical Garden. And if you know, he wrote that beautiful monograph, Agaves of Continental North America. And <coughs> agaves, there's a saying, agave is life. And it, it truly was and still is to people that had access to these agaves, to these, uh, amazing plants either directly or through trade and as a matter of fact we want to put a plug in for a, an absolutely gorgeous documentary called Agave is Life. Uh, it's just been finished by uh, Meredith uh, Dries and David Brown and it's not in circulation yet but uh, it has limited showings at various places in the southwest and so if it ever comes to Tucson um, highly, we highly recommend seeing it. It's an hour long, and it's the most beautiful documentary. I've seen. There's not many documentaries on agave, but it's just <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> I was going to say it's most beautiful, and it's like, well, it might be the only one, too. But, um, but it, it, and it covers a lot. So um, agaves are so important for, we call it a multi-useful plant, uh, many, many purposes. Uh, of course, the obvious for food, of course, beverage. Uh, who's eating, who's drinking uh, margaritas? <laughs> uh, also fiber, ceremonial purposes, the list goes on and on and on. And um, for, f for food, um, for food, that's, that's a well-known use. Um, and we know it's been used for at least eight to 10,000 years for food. And just a real brief uh, description, uh, not all agaves are edible. Uh, those that have what we call low sapogenin or soapy mo low amount of soapy molecules in their tissues are, are the better tasting. And so I don't know if you've noticed out in the, in the hinterlands, you're seeing agaves producing a big flower stalk, right? And to produce that stalk, it has to accumulate a lot of carbohydrates in the form of complex uh, sugars, um, many in the form of fructans. So it produces that big stalk very quickly, too. I've seen them grow a stalk six to eight inches a day. Um, so when the stalk is small, uh, when barely, generally, when barely it protrudes above the leaves, that's when people would harvest them. 
They cut off all the leaves and they would pit bake them in pits and roast them for anywhere from a day to four days depending on the species and the size of the plant. And so this long-term baking converts these complex sugars into simple sugars like fructins into fructose. So it's, it's, and you have, how many of you have had baked agave heart or leaves? Good, yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's very different. Uh, and of course, for, for fiber, very important use for fiber, making sandals, uh, netting, uh, even clothing. Um, and of course, a beverage, making uh, pulque, uh, which is a fermented juice extracted from when you, you cut out the heart of the plant and you collect the juices and you, and, and you ferment. And then of course, the uh, through distillation process, uh, making a type of mezcal when you bake the agaves and then crush them, pulverize them, extract the juice, and then, and then through distillation, getting your um, uh, mezcal. Um, so in Mexico, you know, we've, we've, we know agaves played a really important role throughout history. And, but that wasn't the case in, uh, in the Southwest US. And some people even thought that agaves were, were of minor importance. Uh, there was little data on pre-Columbian use of agaves. And that changed with great work by Charles Mikszczak and, our own, and Susie and Paul Fish, who are here, in the mid-80s, 1980s. And they did work on an area north of Tucson, the Tucson Basin. And they showed where there was all these rock piles, uh, processing twos associated with agave, proce with agave harvesting and processing. And so they... Uh, belief that this was the first evidence of really extensive agave farming, uh, dating back to 800, 800 AD, right, Susie, about that time? Yeah, and, okay. And so, but the problem was, and they were pulling a little bit of macrofossils, a little bit, you know, of teeth and um, marginal teeth, not, but there weren't any agaves there. So, so we wanted to know what agaves were grown. And, and if there are you know, remnants of these plants still in the landscape today. And actually back in the 70s, this one plant here, agave murphii, everyone know that? A whole, whole common agave here. These plants you can buy at Home Depot. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way. <laughs> These plants you can buy at Home Depot, but they have such an incredible story. And it had been surmised that these plants are always found near archaeological features, and they may have been cultivated by pre-Columbian people. And <clears throat> they, they are unusual in that they will de develop their flower stalk before uh, others do they, it, in the winter time. And you know, in the winter time was a pretty lean time for fresh foods for people. And so this was an advantage. And also this species will produce little plantlets in the flower stalk, regardless if the stalk is damaged or not. And it, it, it produces little pups very, it, from rhizomes very easily. And so we surmise that this was probably, and back in the 70s, we, people thought that this was actually an, uh, a pre-Columbian uh, domesticated species that still is in the landscape today. It goes up to, we find it from Lake Pleasant, Tunnel Basin, all the way down to northwestern Sonora. Uh, it's very sketchy, uh, very patchy uh, distribution, uh, and, it, and it is rare. There you go. So my friend Rick Delamater, uh, back in the 80s, was looking for uh, Murphy Eye in Tano Basin, and he came across an unusual one, and we thought, well, this is different. And uh, it was near, uh, always associated with archaeological uh, features like linear alignments and agave processing tools like agave knives to cut the leaves. And uh, it turns out that this plant was actually rediscovered uh, 50 years earlier by Susan McKelvey, who was a botanist at the Arnold Arboretum. And she would often come uh, out west and, um, and search Grand Canyon areas, Tunnel Basin areas, those were her favorite, favorite haunts. And she was very interested in agaves and yuccas. And she found this. She knew it was a different species, but she never described it. And then so many years later, Rick found it. 
And we knew it was different, and he unfortunately passed away suddenly, and we named it in his honor and in memory. Uh, and we called it the uh, Tunnel Basin Agave, Agave de la Matarai. And we thought for a long time it was only found in Tunnel Basin, and then we found it in the Verde Valley. So, hmm, that plant got around. Again, associated with art sites. Well, while looking for those, um, <clears throat> we heard of another agave. Uh, let's see, where's the Philipsiana? <laughs> you know, they start right looking here. all alike, you know. Right here. After. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this little guy here, this actually was, uh, we first heard about it from uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine who's started in the Grand Canyon, way, way north. And uh, again, found the archaeological sites. And it turned out that another woman botanist, about 50 years before that, in the 1930s, first found it, uh, Rose Column, who, by the way, was the first uh, botanist for Grand Canyon National Park. And she knew it was a new species. She didn't describe it. And uh, so, so many years later, 60, 70 years later, uh, we found more. And uh, we named it in honor of Art Phillips, a good friend of mine who's done a lot of Grand Canyon work. And again, we thought for a long time it was found only in the Grand Canyon, and again, guess what? We started finding it in Verde Valley, uh, along the Hacienda River, south of Prescott, and Tano Basin, another plant that got around. And so while looking for these guys uh, in Verde Valley, Verde Valley has turned out to be a hot spot for agave cultivation, uh, we found another Agave, uh, Sacred Mountain, and this is a this is an interesting area. Sacred Mountain archaeological uh, site, and Susie and Paul Fish have done a lot of work up there. Um, <clears throat> it's and we found this agave again uh, near archaeological features. Again, we knew this has got to be a new species, a new pre-Columbian domesticate, and of course, it didn't end there. Uh, while looking elsewhere for these guys, we found the Page Springs agave, which is this one, near its namesake, Page Springs. And so Andrew and I named both of these. The Sacred Mountain we named Agave Verdensis for the Verde uh, Valley. And this one, the Page Springs, we named uh, Yavapayensis for the Yavapai people. And so they're, they're, these two were only found in that area, too, which is interesting. More on that a little later. So, <clears throat> so we have a, a lot of species now, and so there's a lot of basic questions that we're trying to figure out, like where did they come from, right? That's, that's a big one. How, how did they originate from? And so we have a lot of tools in our tool bag to try to figure that out. And you know, one of the common ways is looking at what we call morphology, looking at leaf shape, leaf measurements, flower shape, flower color, fruit shape, fruit uh, structures, and et cetera. Between, and we make comparisons between the domesticates as well as uh, uh, the native species too. We also, um, do chromosome work, you know, looking at chromosome numbers and how they behave. You know, nothing worse than a malbehaved, misbehaved chromosome, you know. And, uh, and then uh, molecular work, too. And Andrew brings uh, a lot of experience with uh, molecular studies, looking at the DNA. And then we also look at biogeography, uh, ethnobotanical information. And so we try to get a lot of information uh, together to try to sort these out. And uh, so, we, so for example, using all these tools, we know agave murphii, the Hohokam agave, uh, we think probably originated in northwestern Sonora. And, <clears throat> and we've always thought that it, it reminds us of another Mexican species. It's called agave angustifolia. And you may not know that particular species, but it's really important. Uh, it, it, agave angustifolia is found throughout Mexico, mainly because people carried it around from pre-Columbian to historic to present time. People still plant them in their, uh, in their, near their homes. And agave angustifolia is responsible for some really important economic agaves. Cecilana, Cecil, rope, right? Uh, for Croides, which is another uh, rope um, fiber-producing agave. And of course, 
Agavi Tequilana, right? So it made sense. And there's some morphological, the terminal spine, similar. There's more morphological characteristics that remind us of angustifolia. And guess what? The molecular work supports that, too. Now, the other ones, it gets more difficult. With the Gavi Philipsiana, uh, the one that we first found in, in Grand Canyon, uh, <clears throat> Andrew has shown that one and the Tonal Basin one, the one named for Rick Della Matter. They are very distinct lineages. Um, probably their progenitor is either extinct, you know, the wild one from which they came from is it either extinct or we haven't found it yet. Probably from northern, northeastern Sonor, northwestern Chihuahua is, is our guess, uh, probably. But we, but we don't know. Um, the Sacred Mountain and the Page Springs agaves actually are closely related to each other, which is interesting. So, and we're going to talk briefly on the significance of that, too. So, anything else you want to add? Well, um, no, maybe we should just uh, describe what a domesticated species mm -hmm. is, because we get asked that a lot. So, how do you know this is a domesticated species? Well, domesticated species are reliant on humans for their existence. So when you think of uh, like watermelon or corn, you don't find that growing in the wild. You actually have to collect the seed and sow it and cultivate it. Um, there's a continuum from cultivated plants or wild plants to cultivated to domesticated and that can be anywhere in between and you can take a plant from the wild and through millennia uh, make it domesticated but then it can revert back to the wild form like radishes in California mm -hmm. have gone back to the weedy form. And so <clears throat> one of the, the cool things about these agaves, because they reproduce asexually by, repro by making little pups off to the side, um, is that this asexual reproduction basically stops this genetic change that would allow it to go from the domesticated state back to the wild state. And so by reproducing only, or for the most part, by these asexual reproduction versus producing seed, these plants basically stay in the same place where they were hundreds of years ago. So we're finding them in abandoned fields that have been abandoned like 500 years ago. And so these are living artifacts in the field. And so we only find those, like Wendy said, associated with the archaeological sites. You don't find them up on the hills away from the archaeological sites. So that's an indicator. The other indicator is that they don't produce seeds, a lot of seeds, or, very, or any viable seeds. And so, again, asexual reproduction is, or, um, is a indicator of um, a cultivated species, C kind of like your uh, navel orange, you know, your seedless watermelon. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's an indication because they don't produce by, uh, with seeds is that, that it's a domesticated species. Um, uh, other indicators uh, for domestication would be taste. And Wendy has done uh, taste experiments with the, the domesticated um, species versus the wild types and found that at least on these unscientific taste tests, we haven't, you know, done the science on this, you know, uh, yet, but that the domesticated are sweeter than the wild ones as, to, as well. And that there is some indication, or at least, you know, when you go to harvest these, um, the leaves, and some of the domesticated ones, are, you, they cut like butter, where the wild ones you have to sit there and saw, too. So when you think about ease of harvesting them, you know, uh, species that would, you could just slice the leaves off would be something that was selected for. So they show characteristics mm -hmm that they're selected for. And so uh, it's the suite of characters on top of being in these fields, um, not seeing them in the wild that gives us these, all these clues that they were used. Yeah, and another uh, character that we think that they selected for was time of flowering. So remember, you, you, for food and for fiber too, um, but, <clears throat> but for food, you, you're gonna harvest them you're going to harvest them. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you're going to harvest them when they're going to show signs of flowering, right? <coughs> There are some, uh, some really magnificent sites, one site in particular that overlooks Oak Creek up near Sedona. It's, we call it Angel Hill. And there are several of these domesticates growing together. And um, all of them have different flowering times. So, so I made a chart, we made a chart and you can actually see comp when you have the wild ones that are up there and then the domesticated ones having all those domesticated ones extends significantly the harvest time for the plant of for the plants for food yeah. so one one thing too i want to mention i mean these are remnant clones the these probably were grown extensively as a matter of fact one of the questions that we asked were how extensive was agave cultivation in arizona it was surprising to us, we think, based on what, what we found out um, in our own intuition, too, and work, you know, Susie and Paul Fish, and huge areas, all the way from Grand Canyon. By the way, Grand Canyon is pretty much, it's close to the northernmost uh, distribution of the whole genus agave, okay? <laughs> So from Grand Canyon down to Verde Valley, to Prescott area, to the Mogollon Rim, uh, Safford area, Tano Basin, and then um, just uh, north of Tucson and just northeast of Tucson. That's, those are big areas for what we believe were uh, areas for cultivation of agave. So we're seeing these remnants of these that have hung on without human care for a long, long time. And so we have to be very careful, especially looking and trying to interpret this through our own biased minds, you know, and trying to figure out how people grew them, why they grew them, how they came up. It, it's very, very difficult. And, but we have to always keep in mind uh, keep a very open mind to um, many alternatives in, in you know, in, th in theories. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see. Let me look at my notes here. So one of the questions, too, well, we're finding all these different ones. We love what's called cryptic species, as biologists, botanists, and do anybody know what a cryptic species is? I know. It's a mystery plant. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, yes. What happens is say you have species A, it's got a wide distribution, it's found, you know, pretty common. And then someone comes along, or people come along and say, you know what? There's more than one species to that. There's, different, there's a different species, or maybe even more than one different species in this group that we're calling species A. And it turns out that it is, through all our tools we're looking at, and it's a different species. And that's really important. You know, when you look at biodiversity, you know, we're concerned, even politicians, you know, get the idea of that biodiversity is important. So how do you get biodiversity? You know, an increased number of species, you know, how many species do you have? And so, <clears throat> and it doesn't happen just with plants. A really great example is in animals, there's a, the killer whale. Uh, there's an Antarctic killer whale, always thought to be one species, and it turns out there are four different species of killer whales. So used to be thought of just one. They all have different feeding areas, feeding behaviors, different ecological niches, which is interesting in itself, but is also interesting if, if you're trying to uh, be better stewards to these species. People say manage. I hate the word manage. Um, so you have to know, first off, there are more than one species and they have different needs, right? So to better manage them, better stewards. Same with plants, too. So it turns out, we, we did work in um, Agua Fria National Monument. You know where that is? Drive through it when you go to Flagstaff on I-17. And for several years, there's an agave up there that really puzzled us. Um, it was always, well, C.F. Chrysantha. C.F. means it approaches it, but it's not really great. Chrysantha, which is a common agave up there. And, uh, and it's found near beautiful uh, terraces, 
man-made terraces, ar other archaeological sites. So we've been working with ASU archaeologists, Kate Spielman and her students, uh, and they became very interested in, the, in, the, uh, in this as well. And, um, and so <clears throat> it turns out that it is different. And again, with morphology, but also the molecular work that Andrew has done, it's different from agave chrysantha, and it's different from other agaves except, now, and this is what I think is pretty cool. When, I'd, when we'd see this plant, the Awafria one, this one right here, it reminded me a lot of the Page Springs one. Guess what? It's different, but molecularly, it's similar. So that tells us, hmm, could this, we, and it produces a lot of seed, great seed. This could be a previously undescribed species native to central Arizona. Does it have something to do with the origination of Page Springs and possibly the Sacred Mountain one? That's our next question. And that would be really cool. So this could be two domesticates that evolved in Arizona from this new species that we've overlooked, which is native to, we think, it's preliminary. Um, so, and it's again based on one region too, right? So there there's a lot of work we need to do. But this is, eh, this is sort of where we're going at because, you know, we do a lot of botany by intuition and just stalled in Zen, you know, you sort of, <laughs> you know, and it's like, they're talking, sometimes I like to talk to you, sometimes they don't, but. Um, so this is gonna be a new species uh, that, that we're gonna, that uh, we're gonna describe. Um, well, come further south, just northeast of Tucson, along the San Pedro River. This was just uh, happening last year. And Bill Doyle, we, we went out in the field, and, and he's, he and his uh, workers have been spending a lot of time out there, doing great work out there. Some of the most magnificent terraces and rock piles we've ever seen. And guess what? Not only he's showing us all these great art sites, he's got a list of where all the agaves have been sited and where they are. This is 60, 65 miles long? 70. 70, oh, 70. <laughs> 70 miles long. You know how many agave sites have been found? 12. They're hard to find. And it turns out, let's see, where's our first one? Right here. This one. It's new. We f caught it flowering. This was cool too, because we were bi binoculating. That's a new term, you know. <laughs> binoculating about 600 meters away, you could see this little thing sticking up. And uh, I thought, ah, that's the flowers, you know. We're like, and it's like 100 degrees out. Yeah, let's go check it out. And sure enough, and it's just a bizarre plant. And then we find out that after, you know, hiking all the way over there and everything, and then there's one that was about 20 feet from our car. <laughs> it's like, um, and not only that, but then we find another one. So, so our experience in the field is really, we're honing in. We know where, you know, we have a better idea, you know, what to look, plus sure helps, you know, know yeah, well, this one's at, you know, this site, you know, that helps a lot. And so we found a second one. And it's different from the first one, and is, which one is that? Is it, let's see, this one right here. And the interesting thing with the second one that we found <coughs> is that it reminds us of the Grand Canyon one, Philipsiana. Very similar. And it turns out that molecularly, again based on one region, it's only different by one base pair. So the big question for us is, well, is it different enough? Is it, you know? Uh, so, so we don't know that from flower or fruit or anything, yeah. we just know it from the leaf material, which is very hard to tell apart. But all the agave philipsiana from Tonto Basin to the Grand Canyon are very similar, all the same, at least in the regions we've looked at molecularly. So to find, based on DNA, that the San Pedro, the San Pedro is different from all the other ones could be significant, but again, we have to find ones in flower and fruit, but it's very rare. Mm -hmm. So how many of them exist? Probably less than 100, and that's because of extinction, you know. They, if you only reproduce by seed, then you have a drought, and the parent plant dies off, you don't have a seed bank with which to uh, emerge from once 
the climate, you know, weather gets better and there's more rain or something like that. And so this system of only asexual reproduction is a very risky system. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with all these domesticates. So, um, you know, there are tens of thousands of acres of rock piles of agricultural fields in Arizona, but very, very, very uh, fraction of a percent have any plants growing in them. And so we are just fortunate that we're catching them in this slice of time before they all go extinct. Now, you mm -hmm. know, who knows how many were grown you know, right. 600, 500 years ago. I know, you know, or even earlier, or too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there could be many that have already gone extinct. And so we're, just, we're just catching. We made it like a little bell curve, you know. And, and if, this, if the top of the bell was like 800 to 1400 AD, you know, wouldn't grown a lot of them. And they could have been growing them earlier than that. We don't know. But, and then the curve goes down, and extinction is his line right here. We're about right there. And there's been a lot of, you know, extirpation and it leading towards extinction. So, so that, that begs the question, you know, how do we protect these uh, really amazing plants? And the Endangered Species Act will not protect them, right? Because? Hmm? Because they're a hybrid? Did someone say that? No? No. Well, uh, one thing we don't know if they're hybrids, but it's true, they, they, the, the act won't protect hybrids, but we don't know if these are hybrids or not. Maybe, maybe not. But the other thing is they won't, it won't protect species that are around because of humans. They are human influenced. Which begs further questions. <laughs> is, that, is that realistic? Are we not part of the system? Are not humans part of the system. We are, yes. And we can't divorce ourselves from what the natural ecosystem. What, what's a natural ecosystem? I mean, humans have been a huge part of ecosystems for millennia. And they change, they alter environments. And a good friend, Muffin Burgess, you know, she wrote in a paper, you know, it's like, uh, where do you draw the line? With, with natural versus, you know, with environments that have been influenced for millennia. And if a culture goes out, then does the, do the plants, for which are a result of the culture, do they deserve to go out as well? I mean, it really begs these questions. And, and, I, and I think that uh, we have to look at landscapes differently. You know, we, we like to call them biocultural landscapes, not natural landscapes, because it brings in, it reinforces the human element of it. Um, and, and then getting back to how to protect them, we've got, actually have some ideas, and um, there's, uh, we're losing them. And so, and we don't know the effects of climate change on them too. Um, and so we think we need to grow them grow a lot of them, keep very good records so that we can put them back into habitat as well as provide them on the market. And what we like is to grow so many of them so that we can actually make mezcal out of them. Yes. Wouldn't that be cool? Have this old ancient crop plant go full circle and people actually care about it and celebrate it celebrate these. So that's our plan. You know, and, and talking, you know, with Greg and, and others too. We need to we need to grow more, grow more of them. Uh, and and do it in a coordinated effort. Uh, or else we I think we'll lose them. Um, the other thing too I'm gonna mention, you know, we talked about working with Bill, working with Susie and Paul and and, uh, and Priscilla Bohr too. She was in Karen Adams was here. Huge supporters of this whole idea, even way back in the 70s and 80s when it wasn't, you know, most other, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, didn't receive the attention that, that, that it does now, but they were huge supporters way back when. But the importance of working, of interdisciplinary research, working with archeologists, working with biogeographers, it just makes the story much more richer, and probably a lot more accurate 
Um, so, <clears throat> so we strive strive to do that. So, um, so getting back to so beyond the whole protection thing, there's also it begs the question too. Okay, were wild native agaves cultivated? Think so? Now you prove it. Yeah, they were. This started with a paper by Paul Minnis, who's here, and Stephen Plogg. Um, it really got our attention. This was a paper that they published in 76. And they were looking at these oddball agave perieis, peris agave, up on the Mogollon Rim. And, uh, and they felt that just the distribution was just funky. But they, they weren't sure if they were cultivated or what the story was. But what was so, it was published in the Kiva, a great little journal. Um, and it caught our attention, it flagged it, which was really important. And then a good friend, Kathy Parker from University of Georgia, who's a molecular geneticist and biogeographer, but um, uh, she did a lot of sampling and actually showed that this population, um, many years later, um, that these indeed were cultivated. And looking at uh, molecular uh, and morphological uh, not only that, but they may, they probably originated not from their closest wild populations, but distant populations, and probably received through trade. So there's another agave, perii, it's called uh, the Huachuca agave. Uh, have you ever hear, heard of that one, the Huachuca agave? This, we've been kicking this one around for a long time. You know, first off, is if it's a good variety of perii, if it's, it's a cultivar. It's in southern Arizona and the Huachuca Mountains, of course, and it gets into Mexico. And again, Kathy Parker said, let's look at that. Looking at population-wise, sampled lots of different populations. And it turned out there's a mountain form of Huachucensis, the Huachuca agave. And you see it growing up in Miller Canyon, up in the Huachucas. And that is the, what we call the wild form. Well, first off, they, the, the Huachuca agave does deserve varietal status. It is distinct enough from typical Perry's agave. Okay, so that an question was answered. And then whether it was wild or cultivated, so you have these wild mountain forms. And then you have these lowland species, uh, lowland populations uh, out in the grasslands. Looking real sort of odd. And so Kathy was really interested to find, to see if there had been uh, archaeological work, and unfortunately there hadn't been. And so, so she proceeded with her sampling and, and showed with her morphological and molecular work that indeed the lowland grassland species were anthropogenic. A lot less degree of uh, genetic diversity and other characteristics. So these were managed, the mountain forms were not. And she concluded that, that you could, in areas where you don't have a lot of archaeological work, you can actually look at the plants and then you can get a hint whether there had been activity, you know, such as cultivation of, of the plants, even though there, there may not have been, you know, archaeological work there. So that, that can um, uh, kickstart further work with that. And she also said you can uh, approach other species, non agaves, you know, in this uh, same way, looking at populations. And, and there are a lot of species, non agaves, that we think were encouraged or cultivated. Uh, prickly pear, everybody knows Engelman prickly pear, right? Uh, there are some very, very big forms of it in the Grand Canyon, in those little side, in those side, not little, you know, side canyons in the canyon, which also grow with are agave philipsiana, big pads, big fruits, tiny seeds. So we think that they're actually brought in by pre-Columbian people. And we can explain the big fruits. You know, you eat the tunas, right? So you select for big fruits. Tiny seeds, you don't want to eat the little seeds, so you select for small seeds. But I couldn't figure out why you would select for big pads, because you use the little pads for food, right? No palitos, big pads. What do you use those for? What do you select for food pads for? I was watching a PBS special that Linda Ronstead was narrating, and, um, and it was about restoration of San Javier de Bac mission. And first time when they were trying to restore it, they didn't do it the traditional way. 
and the mortar cracked, the stucco cracked, and then they did it the traditional way, and guess what they added to the mortar? Prickly pear mucilage. Yeah. And it has, you know, the, the quality so that it doesn't break, it, it's a stronger. So I was really curious, and it was sort of the light bulb went off at that moment, you know, and thought, that's what, that's what they're using for the stucco up there. So I did a little research, and in, in, in uh, I believe, southern central Mexico and some of the big ruins, there is a paper that did show uh, that prickly pear mucilage, they're thinking some kind of prickly pear was found in the stucco of these ancient ruins, as well as cotton, too. So that's a product, I think this would be really fun to work with the Park Service on, you know, the archaeologists. There's other ones, too, the big yuccas up there, huge yucca, banana yuccas with leaves three to four or five feet tall, uh, chia, chia is up there, you know. So, so we need to look at the landscape and looking at plants differently. How did, how did we influence, you know, these landscapes? They did. We're looking at a legacy effect in many areas, not only affecting soils, affecting the plant community, affecting what plants are there, and even speciation of plants. So, um, yeah. Uh, I, think I think it just brings up the, the need for interdisciplinary research and uh, more archaeology, archaeobotany, rather than just salvage archaeology, because there's so many questions that need to be answered um, with a lot of different plants so we, we just don't have enough, you know, how far back in time do these domesticates go? We have no clue. Um, you know, if we had dated, carbon dated fibers with molecular analysis that we could pin back in time exactly where these, you know, where they originated, when they originated, these are big questions for uh, southwestern archaeology. I mean, why were they growing so many species of domesticated plants here, agaves? What other plants were they domesticating and have gone back, to, reverted back to the wild forms? Mm -hmm. So, you know, by doing middens and other things like that, we can really um, gain, gain better insight into what was going on into the economies of these, of these people. Um, also, they were using different uh, technologies in these fields. Mm -hmm for the cultivation of these agaves. So the growing of the agaves in the uh, agave philipsiana in the Grand Canyon is very different than what you see in Tonto Basin. And you know, we, we know they were trading it, but they were trading it across, across cultures and across technology. Mm -hmm. And so people were implementing, you know, the philipsiana even grows in Sedona under mm -hmm. drip lines on sandstone rocks, very different. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it was, Obviously, a very important plant if it was traded that widely, used in different technologies and other things like that. What mm -hmm. was it used for? You know, we know it was multi-purpose, but what was the big one? Was it really ceremonial or? And did it change? Yeah. You know, the uses yeah. changed. Did it change through mm -hmm. time? Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions than answers, but we have a lot to work with, and I'm sure there's a lot more out there. Mm -hmm. So, so should we turn? the questioning yeah. over to some of our folks in the audience and add more questions and yeah. get right. your answers, though. <laughs> <laughs> Just, we'll, I'll bring this around. Uh, I'll be right back to you. Thanks. Um, I'm unfettered by any knowledge about this. My botany class was in 1969 in one semester. But <laughs> here's my question. Um, well, several questions. One, in this process of speciation and, and the development of new species, mm -hmm. when you have organisms that are largely asexual, um, is there still what I have as the stereotype of species, at least with animals, that you they will not interbreed? I mean, they won't pollinate from one species to the other? And that's only question number one, so, let, so just a quick answer to that is, Ag well, agaves will hybridize with distantly related, closely related. These hybridize with wild species. The trick is whether the, it produces viable seed yeah. or not. They'll yeah. hybridize. So, yeah, and you'll get well, but, are, but, but But do they, if they, what I'm, I guess what I'm really getting at, when, when the sexual reproduction is very minimal, Mm -hmm. Does it then come to mutations 
on the cloning that gives you these new species primarily, or they, is it the sexual they, reproduction? They probably originated from a sexual ancestor, and then these plants are the result of some type of form that just uh, got produced and that was saved. So like Concord grape all came from one plant that had this unique characteristics. Okay. And then it was so it's vegetative. mutations in the cloning. Yeah, with okay. vegetative reproduction, you can, you know, it's just like grafting grapes. You can just, you know, mm -hmm. make as many copies as you want. Yeah, so but the copies are eventually going to mutate and give you a new... No, so we, we don't know. These originated from somewhere. Mm -hmm. We don't know if, you know, the wild form is extinct or we haven't found it yet. Or, you know, maybe if it was through hybridization or yeah, through or a mutational. Or, yeah. One okay. thing with but a mutation. Guess, so it could be hybridization or it could be a clonal mutation. It could well, be mutational. Possibly. Yeah. One, okay. And one example, too. Um, several years ago, <clears throat> Gary Naphan and I and uh, uh, another friend, we went to uh, the Pinal Mountains, Kel Kellner Canyon. And it's sort of an infamous story. Uh, a gentleman that lived out there told us that there were these agaves and they were producing uh, plantlets in the flower stalks. And so, oh, it's agave murphii. So we go out there and they're agave chrysantha, which doesn't do that normally. And as a matter of fact, a couple of the plants looked so much like murphii. It was like weird, but they're chrysantha. And it turns out that these were they screwed up plants. Why were they screwed up? because of Silvex, Agent Orange, which went back to the 60s, late 60s, and that area was sprayed under the cloak of vegetation management when it was actually based out of Murano, you know, the CIA project. And they sprayed, and they screwed up the agaves. So you could get this mutated form. You know, I'm not saying that these came from yeah. Silvex, you know, I'm not saying that, but, but it's an example of a mutational form. And so if you clone that plant, you would keep, you'd, you'd have that, um, you'd keep those characters. So okay. mu mutation is, it can be. And, it's, and a more general question, but as a taxonomist, do you think the genetic um, molecular studies are going to eventually replace the classic taxonomic looking at fire, flower structure and that kind of thing? No. Okay. It's a tool. They're, they'll complement each other. Yeah. All right, I saw some other questions or hands up out there. Uh, hello. I just moved here to the Sonoran Desert from the northeast a few months ago, so I'm completely ignorant of the situation here. But when you're talking about this, I was wondering, how did the indigenous peoples discover that when they put rocks over the top of these things that would preserve the moisture or make them grow better or whatever? Hmm. They, they were very sophisticated agriculturalists. Mm -hmm. um, they knew a lot more than we know, <laughs> I think, in some respects about how to eke a living out in this harsh environment. Um, they probably observed nature and just went with what works. I mean, if, if it didn't work, their survival could be on the line. So they had to be very, very smart about what they did. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this technology was transferred from culture to culture, too. So uh, what worked in one place could easily be uh, taught to other people. Uh, did the Spanish colonials uh, export them to Spain and plant them in Spain? Were they introduced into Spain? I don't know about that. Um. They, eventually they did, yes. I couldn't tell you when, but it was, it was a long time ago. Yeah, the, yeah the I mean, Linnaeus. And people always would bring stuff back. Yeah, I, so, you know, uh, we know some of the earliest named agaves were from gardens, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so. going to 1700s, 1600s. Yeah. Did the Spanish do anything or just use a decorative plant? So is that mm. indigenous to the Mediterranean? No. No. Uh, Right, yeah. Agaves is, is New World, and they've gotten around. I mean, I've seen them in Nepal, you know, I've seen them in, you know, it's, yeah, they, because in mainly, uh, in those instances, mainly for um, the uh, fiber 
Um, and now for ornamental or for fencing, you know, and various purposes. Yeah, and then actually there's some really weird uses I won't go into, but. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, I'll follow up on a use that's not so weird. You mentioned at the early part that fiber is an important part of, of the agave leaves in particular. Have you seen any indication that any of these domesticated species are, you gave the impression that lack of fiber was, was something that was maybe selected for in some cases. Is there any evidence of selection for fiber? Um, you know, we don't have a lot on the fiber. The, the little we have was um, Michael Yeats had done some work. He's an archeologist and looking at Murphyi and um, what he found in Karen Adams, Karen, if you have any other, uh, uh, Susie, um, that Murphy I was uh, uh, rot resistant and um, and strong, very good. But yeah, you know, we don't have a lot of data, and that's and 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 that's something we need to do. There's a bias towards food because it's more qu easily quantifiable, and more easily to wrap our heads around. But when you start getting into fiber, which is a little less so, and then especially when you get into ceremonial, <laughs> you know, it's really difficult. So, but we need to focus and beverage too. And, and without a doubt, they were using the gavis for beverage, for making pulque. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, I mean, really. So. Um, so when you're talking about finding the wild progenitors, do you have a lot of data coming out of Sonora? Or um, I know archaeologically there's not as much coming out of Sonora. What was the first part? I'm sorry. When you're trying to find the wild progenitors. Oh, okay. The mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if the situation in the botanical world is the same as in the archaeological world. Yeah, it seems that um, the, the thing that in, in, in Mexico, there's such a continuous use from prehistoric to present, and it makes it more difficult to figure out. We, we haven't really seen good, good science saying this was a pre-Columbian domesticate, not like we're seeing it up here. No doubt there were, but we haven't seen the science yet. It's assumed certain species are. Uh, and they're so diverse. And you know, when I've made trips, I mean, there are so many agaves that I couldn't tell you what they were. Um, there's so there's a great variety of them, different land races. Um, Dr. Gentry did a wonderful basi basis, you know, work from which to expand on. Um, but they're so diversified, and they've been so used for a very long time. They've been managed and, and influenced for so long. It makes it difficult. It's a little easier up here. And even actually. heavily heavily collected in the wild too. Right. So there are there are areas in Mexico where it's really difficult to yeah. It's huge and difficult to get to. And we're yeah, we're over overlooking, I'm sure, species. Does that answer your question? You said that there's um, no protection for plants under the Endangered Species Act. Is does the Antiquities Act cover plants? Yes. Well, it, it's, um, <clears throat> that, that is a great way to protect. As a matter of fact, like with Agua Fria, uh, someone had mentioned to us uh, not too long ago, this was a f great example of protecting large areas encompassing archaeological sites versus just protecting a single site, which I guess was pretty novel. Um, and so we've talked about protecting these agave sites under the Antiquities Act, yeah. This is really exciting. Uh, and I, if you look at it in, in a global perspective, this makes it incredibly exciting. The world's food supply is based on 12 plants. Isn't that scary? <laughs> 3,000 species at minimum were domesticated by ancient farmers and traditional farmers. 12 of them feed us. Scares the deadly daylights out of folks. So everybody's heard of the Doomsday Seed Bank, and there have been mm -hmm. efforts to, to, to find and uh, these, all these small crops and types of crops that are going extinct as industrial agriculture extends. But what people don't think about is crops in the past. 
And this is the best example in Western North America of showing how archaeological research can potentially be helpful. There are five people in this room who are the core folks who've mm -hmm. discovered this agave. And think about it, Hocom is one of the most, most heavily and intensively studied areas in North America. And yet, it's only been relatively recently that this incredible work of the number of cultivated and number of domesticated plants of just this one genus, agave. Mm -hmm. Think about in other areas of the world where there are ancient farmers that haven't been studied nearly as intensively. How many hundreds of cultivated plants were there that became extinct that we don't know about? We're only going to know through archaeology. And I think the agave example that the people have worked on, so many of them again who are in this room or central, have really given us a model for important information that may help sustainable uh, agriculture as we go into climate change and population increase and all other things. You know, they may be extinct, but that doesn't mean they can't be redomesticated. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that there may be genetic information. If it was good, if it was useful for people in the past, who knows? There may be genetic, useful genetic information in the future. And so this agave stuff is really exciting because it's the best example I know of in Western North America of exciting work that isn't just interesting for itself or understanding anthropogenic landscapes, but it's really interesting for helping having a sustainable future that uh, gets lost in some of the details. Mm -hmm. End of sermon. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thank Father you. Paul always gives a good sermon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is just a comment. But if so many species went extinct, maybe there was a reason. Maybe people quit cultivating them for a reason that they were using too many resources for the product that they were produced. So maybe they just didn't go extinct by accident. Just a comment. Well, one thing I, I think we should remember that some of these words and categories we are using are our own invention. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the difference between cultivated and wild. And we all know what that means, right? Uh, and we could imagine what it means for agaves. But there are traditional farmers in Mexico who aren't so concerned and maybe aren't thinking in exactly those categories uh, because when they go to plant their fields, they are likely to use offsets from former cultivation, but they're also taking offsets from non-cultivated areas mm -hmm. that are near them because mm -hmm. they want agaves that are very suited to their own environmental conditions. So in those cases, either they don't, they're not thinking in those categories or they don't care because what they want is the crop. Now you could also argue, and I think it's very valid, that those offsets they're taking from the wild, whatever that is, um, might have been cultivated in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, again, as Wendy says, we have these, these landscapes of people who are cultivators, and their landscapes and all the things in them are influenced. But we need to think about, too, what are, what are these categories we're using? Mm -hmm. Because I think the same plants can go from one category to another and back again. So, um, you know, we, we understand these things in our own terms, but um, I think the more we talk to those traditional farmers, the more we'll understand how they're thinking about it too. Yeah, and I think, just a quick comment on that too. Uh, I was talking to Patricia Colunga Garcia Marin, and she's this wonderful person, uh, scientist uh, in Yucatan, and she's done a lot of agave work. And one of the papers that she published, it, remember agave angustifolia? Remember that one? The one that gives us tequila agave? And, uh, and she did a study that showed the, how the traditional farmers would grow a lot of different races of just this one species, angustifolia. And unfortunately, um, the, the big tequila industry yeah, the producers, they, they force the government to pass a law that they should only grow the blue azul. So what happened? We've lost, she said, something like 18 races, these forms of the agave angustifolia. 
Um, so, you know, it's a very dynamic, changing, you know, thing that's, that's going on. Um, if we lost it for good, I, d I don't know. Um, but these things can happen. These have really big effects. Mm -hmm. One final question here. Oops. So, Wendy, with the um, thought of domestication, could, could the Arizona domesticates have an analog in agave aplanata, which was brought up from central Mexico and then mm -hmm. brought up to the northwestern Mexico? And then when it's brought into these natural areas or into new areas for it, it crosses with native species and produces mm -hmm. something different. Could the, the, mm -hmm. the Arizona domesticates have had a, a pathway like that? Like the sacred in the Page Springs ones? Right, yeah. Um, <coughs> it's possible. It's possible. Um, I'm thinking, you know, with this uh, uh, Awafria one, I still think that has something to do with it. And if that uh, is native to Arizona, you know. But our, our minds are open. I mean, it's very, very possible that it could have, like uh, Aplanata and then hybridizing with something else. I think that there were probably species that we don't have now, for sure. Yeah. You, you had your hand raised up for a long time. Yeah, uh, not yet, but down the road, again, you know, we want to have a coordinated effort in working with growers so that we know what's being taken and it's controlled and getting them, because that is a good way. I mean, because words got out, you know, that, that, you know, people, which is great, you know. We're so excited to see people get excited about these plants. There is another side to it, too. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, people don't collect them when they shouldn't, you know. So having said that, though, we need to make sure we do our best in, in, in helping the situation out. And one way is to get them growing and have it available to, for people to have in their gardens. It's the same with rare cacti. It's, it's worked. It's got to be coordinated. You have to work with the agencies. Um, and, but, it, but it works. A concern right now is there's, uh, you know, there's not a lot of them. You know? So we want to build it up and then be able to, to do that. You know. Let's uh, say thank you to Wendy and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.